The strongest thing with rhythm is a pulse. How you came to be where you are today. Not insufficient to describe my music, but insufficient to describe the phenomenon that is jazz. How do these diverse cultural elements shape your music? Create an environment for some kind of creative magic to happen. Hip-hop has taken a different turn. I got really interested in sampling and beat making. You're never gonna find your voice unless you're thoroughly educated yourself. I want to be rooted in the things that I, I feel strongly about, and looking deep into the traditions of their music. Good afternoon. This is your Pan-African show called Africa with your host, Kazalor Sefu. Yet again, our show comes with an amazing guest. Welcome to our studio. Thanks for having me. It's Thank great to be you. here. If you could please introduce yourself. My name is Makai McRaven, and I'm a drummer and producer, multi-instrumentalist uh, based in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. Beautiful. Welcome to Ethiopia. Thank you. It's Just always <laughs> been a dream to come here, so it's really, it's really great. Brilliant. So, you know, before I dive into the questions, I would like to know how you were able to come to Ethiopia, uh, even though we're happy to have you, but what made you take this trip at this time? This trip, you know, it's been kind of a long time coming, just wanting to spend more time on the continent mm -hmm. in general, um, especially I travel a lot. Uh, for my music, I'm always going to Europe and, mm -hmm. and this and that. So it was like something that I've been trying to set forth for some time and um, connect with different people that I, I have like I have connections with. And um, I had the opportunity last year to kind of start working on a recording project in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, as well as some travels uh, working with some Ganao musicians in Morocco. And this last trip kind of all came together. I just played a festival in uh, Casablanca. Oh. And then we went down to Cape Town to do some recording. And on the way back up to Europe or London, uh, it, just, it just was a really <laughs> great opportunity to stop here and see, see friends. And Beautiful. So welcome to Ethiopia. I'll Thank say you. that again. If you could tell us a little background who you are, how you grew up, and how you came to be where you are today. I came up in a very musical household. Both of my parents are musicians. And um, my father is an African-American jazz drummer, Stephen McRaven. And uh, he's played with a lot of great legends like Youssef Latif and uh, Sam Rivers, Archie Shep, uh, just a few musicians that he was working with when, when I was young, and, and Marion Brown, who actually brought him to f France. And he relocated in Paris and met my mother, who is from Hungary, and she's a Hungarian folk singer, and uh -huh. does kind of like Eastern European kind of folk music, gypsy music. And she left Hungary um, working with the group Kalinda. Hey, the June, the hot boy. And met my father in Paris, and eventually she uh, went there, and I was born in Paris. And but uh, quickly we moved to the United States, and I grew up on in a small college town area in western Massachusetts, on the New England, on the east coast of uh, the United States, northeast. And um, just kind of quickly, that was just kind of where I got involved in the local music scene and music scene from my parents that they were involved in and there was a lot of great people in the area and it just uh, was a really nice place to, to come up and yeah. eventually I started a band that was kind of like a hip-hop funky jazz rock band um, that really quickly, like in high school, started to really take over a lot of parts of my life. And um, quickly through college there, just became really busy, really quite busy, the active music world. <laughs> music world. And that was, that was it from, from there. So you already knew 
I guess, at a young age that that was your way? Or were you thinking of other... Well, you know, like seeing my parents' paths in music, you know, and the struggle that there was, even though the amount of great things they were doing and involved in and traveling the world and working with legends and all these different things that were, were just incredible. I got to kind of see firsthand, but I also know that how it wasn't the easiest path and, and the choice of the artist, it comes with sacrifice and dedication and, and, and you have to do it for the right reasons to get all everything out of it, which is, you know, and so there was part of me that was like when I was young and um, my grandparents who were much more coming from like, like less like artists, but they were like a very educated African-American family did quite well. And um, I think it was interesting for my dad to go into music. And so, but I, you know, there was a lot of pressure for me to try to go to a university and, and do something. And, and so when I thought about music as a career, you know, I, I, you know, often I don't think of, I mean, I very much think of them together, but, but I feel like they're different things, art and music and culture and then career. And so I was like, well, what am I gonna study in school, you know, or do? That's not music, you know. So I, I, there was parts of me that didn't necessarily want to just go into it full time, or wanted to figure out how to different ways to support myself. But no matter what I did, it just kind of like it just kind of took over and just grew and grew and grew very organically. And um, and when I so when I made the full decision to go all the way in, kind of my late around 18, 19, um, you know. I went really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and they accepted it, obviously. Of course, eventually yeah. they no, everybody, do. Everybody accepted yeah. it, and I was very encouraged the whole way. And then eventually I moved to Chicago uh, after I met um, my now wife. And Chicago kind of really ended up being the place that I kind of really took off in my, my career and, and, and like in making my own music and putting out my own albums and, and being an artist um, as well as like just a working musician, but having kind of a platform to present um, to my vision of, of my music. Your album in these times has been described as the culmination of a project over seven years in the making. Can you talk about the evolution of this project and how your vision for the album changed over the years? I had been working on a concept around a record like this kind of since my early uh, desires of kind of putting out my own records. And, I, and, you know, I've done a lot of work with a variety of rhythms, you know, but I got very interested in, in multimeter rhythms, sevens and elevens and nines and things that were challenging time signatures or hard time signatures, you know. And, um, but wanting the, to take those complex rhythms and present them in ways that felt very natural to the body and feeling because a lot of times when we were learning these complex rhythms in school it was like a math problem or mm -hmm. or and and i was introduced a lot of different odd rhythms both my mother and and my father and just all the rhythms and i wanted to be able to take that kind of complexity and present it in a way that a lot of people could feel it across a lot of different genre and um, that just kind of led me to write these tunes. And as I was working on writing these tunes and finding the right platform to release uh, a project like this, I ended up making a variety of other records that were more like production based and chopping live imp improvisation up. Um, that kind of led me, my, like kind of springed my career into a, new, into a new place where I was eventually able to have large ensemble concerts and, mm -hmm. and put together big projects where I could have strings and, and all this. And and so what just started as these compositions and a the thing then eventually turned into a much larger yeah. project that was much more largely orchestrated. And, and through that process, you know, I was like looking for like ways to embody the music with a, with the title that was like, you know, both talking about the um, the actual music, the times, but also was connect with other other things socially. And when I got um, involved a little bit with through some interviews with a progressive 
newspaper in Chicago called In These Times. And you know, when I was dancing around with things like hard times or difficult times, mm -hmm. that really just like, uh, it really stuck with me. And eventually um, it just evolved. When I work on projects, I like to like kind of set the process to go. And then from there, like, it's more of like a process of discovery than like a, an idea that like, this is what I want to do, or this mm -hmm. is what I'm going to prescribe, or this is what this means. It's more like, I'm like, well, what am I making? What does it mean? And what is it saying? And, and what am I discovering and learning through this process? And that's kind of how the evolution of that record got to where it was. Beautiful. You've mentioned that the term jazz is insufficient to describe your music. How would you describe your musical style and its relationship to the jazz tradition? Yeah, I mean, I would rephrase that a little bit is not insufficient to describe my music, but insufficient to describe the phenomenon that is jazz, you know, and because jazz has been around for so, as, so long at this point and has gone through so many subgenres and different um, ways of, of being or being interpretive what the word means. So it's just to different people, um, jazz might mean different things. It could just mean instrumental to some people, right. or it might mean it might mean it really has to be like a swing, you know, or so some people don't like to add fusion into the jazz space. So I kind of feel like when we're talking about music now, contemporarily, like my music that is like kind of you know, taking from and flirting with a lot of different things wherever I can pull from, just like all the jazz greats have done, mm -hmm. to call it squarely jazz can be confusing mm -hmm. to some people and, and doesn't really give a real description of what it is because somebody could hear it and be like, well, that's not like jazz. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like jazzy. <laughs> and, and depending on the level of like, uh, your involvement in jazz or how much how deep you're into it you know you might be able to have a nuanced conversation about that mm -hmm. or that might just mean something um, very just simple to you and that all of that is okay but then when we want to really have like a intellectual discussion about words mm -hmm. and you ask me like is your music jazz well, I'll be like well if I'm talking to uh, like some people say yeah I'm a jazz musician I make jazz music but then I'll qualify that somehow to give a, a broader description. And, and, um, and with you know, some of the problematic nature of the term jazz, it just becomes part of the, the debate, you know, a discussion mm -hmm. more than anything. And, and um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. You often blend improvisation with hip hop sampling techniques. Can you walk us through your creative process when working on a new piece? When I am, am employing uh, improvisation, you know, uh, in like the sampling process, to me it's like, um, like akin to a brainstorming session, you know, or a collective group uh, composition. Okay. So if I, or, or if it's just me, just a solo kind of um, spontaneous composition, you know, and it's kind of a the, the idea that, you know, there is a, it's a gradient of grays between composition and improvisation. And anything that you compose is born out of the moment at, at some point. You have to improvise it out at some point. And then the next process towards composition is like, is in my view would be kind of editing that improvisation or containing it or, or even just saying, I improvise that it's done. Mm. This is done, it's a composition. But at some point, you know, we're all improvising through life. And so when I'm using improvisation, like I might like to play a small performance um, with a group of other musicians, maybe without much speaking, just to like create an environment for some kind of creative magic to happen. Mm. That, that we just, we're, that we're just gonna happen. And that could be messy, mm -hmm. you know? But then through the processes of sampling, editing, um, and all the studio magic and techniques from dub to uh, electronic music to hip hop and, and to even like all the studio magics of, the, uh, of rock and roll and, and just pop music and early pop music, there's so much you can do with the studio, so it's more of a compositional kind of process of, of improvisation and, and then utilizing the tools of the recording arts to my advantage.
Growing up in a multicultural household with influences from both Eastern European folk traditions and African American jazz, how do these diverse cultural elements shape your music? I think more so, I don't know, not more so, but along with the direct influences of the music that, that they were playing, you know, the, the most influence I got from my parents and them coming together and both the way that they've approached their music, it kind of coming and looking deep into the traditions of their music, and, but also being kind of very forward people looking for not to just do it in the traditional way, but to do it new mm. as themselves and, and now. And so I think the thing is less than it's like, oh, I had the Hungarian influence and I had the, you know, black American influence, but it was more like, I feel like I was raised by very adventurous, open-minded people that were looking to like break bounds in the world and, and find um, connections and find more truths about themselves and their own culture through other meeting others and, and, and studying about other music. Because it wasn't just like Hungarian music and, and jazz. There was Afrobeat and there was, I mean, there was just so much, there was so much, there was so much music that they, they were interested in and listening yeah. to because, you know, for instance, my mom, she just was, wanted to learn about so much of music of all over the world. And as uh, her going to school and becoming a music educator, that was one of the things she really incorporated into all of her co coursework, was the kind of taking her students to different regions wow. of the world and teaching about traditional musics and about musics of the world. And, you know, my father made a record called International World, and he's working with all sorts of musicians um, from around the world. And for me, when I was a kid, I thought that was just the way things were. And, um, you know, even moving into a place like Chicago, you know, that was a big city that was very diverse, mm -hmm. but seeing the segregation was like, wow. And, um, you know, all of this kind of has influenced me to kind of like want to do similar work as, as my folks in the way that I do music. Your work has been called 21st century folk music. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if I heard that. <laughs> I, know. I read it somewhere. How do you define folk music? And in what ways do you see your compositions as a continuation of this tradition? Yes. I think that's a, yeah, that's a great question and it's a complex question. You know, I think sometimes, just like jazz, words can have uh, limitations when describing everything. So sometimes when I would use folk music, I might use it very liberally in the sense of music uh, of oral tradition and, and, and the transference of culture through oral practice. And so like jazz in that sense, which is like a, maybe a little more modern music, like at like its roots and maybe not where it's is everywhere in the world now in academia and everything but at the roots i've always was taught this is an oral tradition and and we're passing this knowledge down to you and you pass it and you continue to pass this and we hold on to like tenets of, of culture and, and things like that and so that's kind of how i've kind of feel as myself you know and also coming from a family of musicians and feeling like this is a tradition that I want to take part in and this is an oral tradition and it's not really um, and that's where that's where but like when coming to like you know I mean it's, I feel like oral traditions then and this is a, a belief of mine too is that it takes a lot of work mm. to keep them in one in one way and often culture and things move like over the long term of, of history there's almost like a game of like the telephone as it keeps on mm -hmm. going, there's evolution. evolution. And so even within the like, the, the deepest mm -hmm. kind of like traditions, there's still evolution. I don't, that's hard to know how much things it's have gone. changed. Yeah. And, 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 and in that spirit in the modern world, like I am very much into evolution and progression, mm -hmm. you know, as well. So when I engage with my work, you know, I'm very much in a tradition, it, also in the tradition of the jazz artists that I, I really, really love and respect who were just forward thinkers, that's kind of what I want to take part in. And when I play jazz, I don't necessarily mean I want to play the genre of jazz necessarily. And like I have problems with maybe other problems with the word terminology again, but following in the footsteps of the progressive black artists that came before me is really the tradition that like 
I really want to take part in. When you just described uh, folk music, you said it was an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So can we compare folk to the griots or even now, as we say, uh, it has evolved. Can we say hip hop? Because if it's oral tradition, mm -hmm. that means even though hip hop has taken a different turn, if they were talking about what went on back in the days, mm -hmm. then I think we would still think that it was an oral tradition, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think Can it we? takes, yeah, I, I think it, it's part of the black diaspora and traditions that have, I mean, gone and, yeah. and exploded in many ways. You know, I think it becomes difficult when art and culture enters the capitalist space and, and commercial space, and then everything gets murky and comp complicated another level. But on the level of, of kids coming up on the streets, coming together, rapping, taking pieces of their, uh, what they knew from their folks, but then mm -hmm. evolving that into something that was really happening organically, and that evolving into something that's now ubiquitous as, <laughs> as anything, you know. It's, it's yeah, I, I think it participates in the same, in yes. Group. Okay. Can you share some specific stories or events that influenced this album? Yeah, I can give a, a, one a specific okay. one though. Like when I was speaking on the uh, publication in these times, which was, you know, there was a guy, Studs Terkel, and he had conducted a number of interviews with working people across the spectrum um, from, you know, great artists and musicians, um, writers to, um, you know, labor workers, gold miners, and he's traveled a bunch. In celebration of his archive of all these, of these interviews he did on his radio show, I was interviewed to give the kind of life of what it was to be a working musician. And, and I gave my feeling, this is what life is for me. And, and it was really a description of, you know, working and playing gigs and weddings and working in bars and then going on a, a tour and playing something and everybody thinks it's really special and then doing some other gig where you get paid very little and and just the hustle of, of the working class musician which is a really incredible thing that you can do that in a city like Chicago and you can just play music and survive and and that's a really incredible thing that we have in Chicago. But that doesn't mean it's not easy. It doesn't mean there are not a lot of people falling through the cracks who might have had to stay on the street at some point and, and everything, right? And so I just gave kind of um, a look at my life at, and, and I was very candid. And a lot of musicians, I think, don't really want to talk about what's you know, under the hood, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, because we all have our, our facade. And so when I did that interview, I was reached out by so many artists around the country, musicians, who said, they said, wow, you really spoke to me. This is like my life, you know, nobody talks about this. And that was kind of, that was one of the first time I was like, I really kind of connected with in these times as an idea and a thought and, um, and kind of wanted to like kind of, not only kind of go into talking about working people in the lives of real people in these times, those times, before past, present and future, um, but then also get the chance to kind of like really uh, interface with some of the great thinkers that were that were interviewed uh, as well. Who does your, because I noticed you have quite a lot of records. Yeah. And I noticed you have some very interesting artworks on the cover of your uh, record. Yeah. Um, well, you know, every time we do a record, um, and I've been working with the great label International Anthem as well as uh, XL uh, Recording Company um, and others. But anytime you do a record, you have to f find a way to kind of embody that or present that with some imagery. And, you know, I, with this last one, within these times, you know, I had a lot of help from the label to kind of interface with different artists because we were working not only with the cover, but we did um, kind of videos with visual artists and, and a number of, and a number of different kind of presentations. So, you know, often when um, it gets to that point in the record, I have some ideas, I have my feelings, but you know, I really kind of interface with my, my team to like help me kind of work through a lot of, the, of those pieces and, and, and connect with different artists that I don't know. And, and, uh, there was one that I noticed that had a lot of heads. 
Yes, that was Damon Locks, um, an artist and musician from Chicago. He leads an incredible uh, project called Black Monument Ensemble, and he is just a kind of multi-talented, um, multi-discipline artist. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was great to get to work with him on, on that. You've worked with a wide array of international musicians. How do these collaborations influence your music and what do you learn from these cross-cultural exchanges? There's so much, there's endless amounts of things to learn, you know, and the world is so vast. You know, anytime you collaborate with anybody, it's, it's an opportunity to, to learn. And, and so I feel that whether I'm working cross-culture and these days, you know, when I've been working with people, I mean, I can learn everything from specifics of, of certain genre or music that they play. They could show you a rhythm, show you a thing, but it, it could be much more um, broad than that too. It could just be a, like kind of a feeling and I can learn, learn something about uh, playing, just about improvisation together with somebody who's coming from a slightly different angle. But to me, it's just a great chance to learn. Your music often deals with complex rhythms and time signatures. How do you balance the technical aspects of your compositions with ensuring they remain accessible and engaging for your audiences? I feel like rhythm, at complex or not, is, it has universality, and we have receptors to, mm -hmm. to feel that. And just because, you know, like uh, a lot of contemporary music, you know, that we hear on the radio mm -hmm. is, is quite uh, narrow, I don't think that people don't have the capacity to feel it. And so I, I use different techniques though to um, bring rhythm because I think the strongest thing with rhythm is, is a pulse, you know, which is essentially a pulse is the root of vibration, you know, and that is what we're, we're feeling. And so if, if I can put out a good pulse, no matter if there's 11 beats going this way or that way, if we can make the pulse feel good, you know, then I think that really resonates with people in a, in a strong way. And, and, and so that's really the kind of the goal even. And then the complex rhythms, that's, that's just to keep me interested. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. You've been involved in reimagining and remixing works like artists like Jill Scott Heron and Blue Note Records catalog. What draws you to these projects? And what do you aim to bring to these Reinterpretations. Um, as coming up as a young musician and influenced by hip hop, um, I got really interested in sampling and, and beat making. And so the idea of sampling and recontextualizing sound, reusing recorded sound and recorded moments, you know, to create new music became something that was fascinating to me and something I wanted to learn how to do and participate in. And, you know, with sampling, you know, after the early 2000s, it became more and more difficult to sample. And there was a lot of uh, legal stuff that came mm -hmm. in for copyright stuff, which is great. And so what I was like wanting to get into beat making, I was, wasn't sure how to do it exactly in the, that sense. And I started sampling myself, you know, sampling my improvisations. And when that kind of took off, um, opportunities came mm -hmm. and people were, you know, like, hey, wouldn't, would you be interested in and working with this project or would you be remixing this or or this and that and and so i i you know or i or even with blue note i've always wanted to sample stuff and you meet somebody from blue Note, okay, wonder if that's possible to sample stuff and eventually i just they, I, these projects kind of came to me in in different ways and um but it was all really kind of me kind of speaking it into existence by trying to find ways to learn about beat making learn about sampling wanting to participate in this kind of modern electronic world of music making, even though I came up in a more organic space. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how, how that all kind of came about. Okay. You've referred to your music as of the body and of the people of the earth. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's I, I, maybe somebody shortened. Did. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, 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 that, but, yeah. How do you ensure your music resonates on this visceral communal level? I don't know, but I, I'm exactly, but it's like, I, I think, I really believe in, in live music and the live space. And often when I think, 
thinking of a performance versus even, even versus a recording or anything. The thing that I want to embody is, is just the energy in the room and connecting with people. And there's different ways that happens, but it could, but like when the room of people are together, there could be no sound. And that could be the most powerful thing, you know? And so kind of being on stage and working with the energy of, of the, the space and the people. And, you know, sometimes uh, to do that, you know, there's different things. Sometimes I just like to get, I'll, I will do exercise and I'll come on stage and I'll get really quiet. And if people are talking and stuff, I'll just wait and wait and wait and wait. And then everybody gets quiet. And then I say, hey! And then everybody laughs. But then when we start the music, everybody is with us and we can go on a journey. And, and it's not whether it's the best performance or, of, that we have or the tightest, but like what happened in the room. You've said that your work is a dialogue between the past, the present, and the future. How do you navigate this temporal blend in your music? And what do you hope listeners take away from this interplay? Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what I want the listener to take a pl take away. Like I don't know that it, what yeah, I want to tell them really what, to, what, exactly. what I want you to go away with. <laughs> but for me, like I want to keep my connections to the past and to the music, and and want to respect the music and 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 do that. But I want to be going into the future, and I want to be playing music that's going to really connect with the a lot of people and young people and old, you know. And so, I mean, I guess that's the thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do is, is, con is connect. And, but in terms of like uh, myself, it's like I, I want to be rooted in the things that I, I feel strongly about and I want to be free. That can be a dialogue that I'm having, you know? It's not one or the other. No, <laughs> <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> Considering your unique upbringing and the varied musical scenes you've been a part of, what advice would you give young musicians who are trying to find their own voice in, rap in a rapidly changing musical landscape? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like finding your voice isn't necessarily reinventing the wheel, All right. you know? And, and I think that can be daunting to a lot of people. They're like, I need to come up with something that nobody's ever done. You know, or I have to be so different that, you know, I'm, I, and I think it's, it's really like, again, it's a thing of self-discovery and being honest with yourself and following the music and the sounds that you want to follow without feeling like, and, and blocking out the pressure of the outside world and what they think you're, you're supposed to do. And, but whatever you do, and whatever you invest yourself in, in all the learning that you want to do and, 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 and keeping an open mind. That's the other thing, keeping an open mind and, and learning as many things, you know? I think that, to me, is, gives you the tools to find your own kind of mix of all the spices to create your blend, which is you, you know? And, and it's not somebody else's blend or say, like, that's too spicy, <laughs> you know? That's, that's not spicy enough for me. That's too sweet. And finding your voice is, is, is to me, a study, self-discovery, and an open mind, and, and a dedication to being thorough. You know, because you're never gonna find your voice unless you're thoroughly educated yourself. That's very true. But that was my last question, oh, by the man. way. If, if there's anything that you think, I know this is your first time here, yeah. so you haven't really even gotten a chance to see our music scene for me to say, yeah. You know, or for you to say anything about our th thing, but, and I don't know if I could say that, but I think the answer, that I think what you said now would suffice for the well, whole. Well, and I've, I'll just add, you know, yeah. advice to musicians and finding your voice and, and, and building something in your community is, um, you know, is just, I believe in the work ethic and go, 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 make things, put it out to the world, um, look to other places and and like keep something of yourself to present to every every everyone and that kind of true um, dedication is is the best advice I can give. Beautiful, thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you everyone for watching your show Africa with your host Katsalor Kaseifu. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.